YouTube is actually full of videos about installing handrails on staircases. If you're into that kind of thing, there's lots to watch. But I haven't seen much, at least in the last decade, that talks about the most interesting part of the project, how to make your own handrail. And believe it or not, you may sometime want to make your own handrail. For one thing, if you're going to go to the trouble of building a staircase that's really nice, wouldn't it also be nice to tell people you made all those parts yourself? rather than just ordering them from Home Depot and assembling them? That was our biggest motivation. We've been restoring a staircase while making all the parts ourselves. The risers are copper, which being indoors should eventually develop a nice rainbow patina. We made the treads and the balusters from white oak, all of which we'll talk about in a future video. But besides wanting to make all of this in our own shop, I also wanted it all to match. That means making it, including the railing, from the same stock of white oak, because there can be a lot of variation in color. And believe it or not, since most of the home centers only stock railings that are made from fir, poplar, and maybe red oak, a white oak railing of the length that we needed is a pricey special order item. So it was actually less expensive to buy the rough lumber and the special router bit that I needed to make it myself. Plus, it's a really satisfying and interesting project. So let me show you how we did it. As you can see from this mock-up, a railing doesn't require a large, thick chunk of wood. It's actually made by laminating several smaller pieces together. The cap is about an inch thick. You could glue two thinner boards together to achieve that inch thickness if you had to, but there would be more seams. As it is, the only visible seam will be all but hidden beneath the roundovers on the sides. Beneath that are three more layers that combine to make its full thickness. So the final dimensions are two and a half inches by two and a half inches. But you'll want a bit more than that to start out so you have something to mill away after glue up. Here you can see the individual components that will make up the rail blank. Notice that that centerpiece is actually narrower than the gap it must fill. That's just what we had left of the wood, and it won't matter, as you'll see later. We're using five-quarter rough sawn white oak, which you can get from most hardwood dealers. Even after jointing and planing, this will give us the one-inch thick material that we need to reduce the number of layers and visible seams in the railing. Projects like this are where it really pays to have a jointer and a planer in your shop. I could have had this lumber just milled at the hardwood dealer, and that may be your only option if you don't have these tools. But the ability to custom mill your own boards in your own shop as you need them will open up a whole new world of projects and possibilities for your shop. We didn't have boards long enough for the 14-foot main railing that the stairway required, so we had to lengthen our rail blank with glued butt joints. Each layer will have a butt joint in a different place, and none of them will line up once the rail blank is assembled. The inner layer can even have multiple joints, as long as none of them fall over any of the seams in the outer layers. These short brad nails are driven through the pieces in the inner layer just to help keep things aligned as it's clamped together. A router bit will not cut deeply enough to reach these little nails. As the second side, and finally the top layer is added, Care is taken again to ensure that none of those end seams on any layers line up with each other. I like them to be staggered about a foot apart. This will ensure that a lot of long grain glue surface is holding the railing together rather than just those small end grain connections. All of our seams fall within a two foot span, so a call is clamped against that area and as much of the rail as possible is clamped down to the flat bench top. This will help ensure the glue up comes out nice and straight. On this shorter piece, you can see how the layers are glued together. Again, ignore that narrow center layer. That made no difference because, as you'll see, we're cutting a groove there later. Use lots of clamps and be prepared for some scraping once the glue dries. If you do have a joiner, you may wish to make sure your corners of the final blank are nice and square because this will make the routing process easier. Working with long work pieces can be challenging, but some roller stands or a little help from a friend can make it manageable. Again, this joining step is optional. You could just be really careful when you do your glue up, but jointing and planing afterwards is a good way to be sure your blank is nice and square. The planing step also evens out the seams and brings your blank down to its final size, which again is two and a half by two and a half. 
Routing such a large workpiece is all about featherboards and hold downs. We have a double stack of featherboards to apply pressure toward the fence but we also need something to apply pressure down onto the table. And this has to be narrow because the blank is nearly as tall as the fence itself. We came up with a piece of hardwood with the end slightly tapered so the blank wouldn't catch on them. And the contact edge is waxed so everything slides smoothly. To be sure that the extra long blank doesn't drift away from the fence as it exits the cut, another featherboard, or in this case, just another scrap of wood, is clamped on the outfeed side of the router table. Here the short blank is test fit to be sure everything is set properly. We want it to slide smoothly while staying against the fence and the table throughout the cut. And here we go. A roller stand may be used to support the long blank as it comes off the router table. If you have a friend assisting you, be sure he only supports the workpiece. He has a lot of leverage in his hands. It would be easy for him to inadvertently pull the piece away from the fence, even with the featherboards in place. His job is to support the blank, not to fight with it. During these first cuts, we're creating a groove that the ends of the balusters will fit into beneath the rail. We're using a half inch straight bit, and the groove must be as wide as the balusters are thick, which is about an inch. So this is cut in two passes, rotating the workpiece 180 degrees to ensure that groove remains nice and centered. The side profile is formed with a special router bit from Whiteside. I'll link to it below this video. If your router is powerful enough, you may be able to do this in one pass per side. Otherwise, just take multiple light passes adjusting your fence and your featherboards incrementally as you remove the material. If you're doing this in multiple passes, I recommend alternating between the two sides so your final fence positions will be exactly the same for that final pass on both sides and both profiles will perfectly match. The next step is to round over the top edges to get a comfortable grip and an attractive appearance. A round over bit with a one inch radius will work nicely. Set the fence slightly proud of the bit's bearing so you leave a little flat spot along the edges of the rail. This will give you something to run against the fence as you make your cuts and that'll make the process easier than it would be if the bit cut the entire surface away. That little flat is then eliminated with some sanding. As you sand, pay careful attention to how the surface feels. Hands will be run across this railing for many years. Any imperfection will stand out. The same is true when you apply your finish. This is a wipe on poly and it must be lightly sanded with say 600 grit between each of the three or four coats to ensure a silky smooth surface. Later when the balusters are installed, the tops will go into that groove on the bottom of the railing and then the spaces between them will be filled with pieces of oak. But that's a different video. See you next time. MyWoodcutters.com is the sort of small business I like to support. Stefan is a great guy and he can find you knives and cutters for almost any joiner, planer, shaper, or molding machine. And his are the best prices if you're planning to upgrade to a Helico carbide cutter head. Please use the link below this video to check with him before you buy somewhere else. Some small businesses are just worth supporting.